Hey, we are into our second week of our sermon series, this idea of loving relational vampires. And uh, before I get too far, I just want to remind you, if you have not uh, downloaded, uh, I put together a 28-day uh, Bible reading plan on how to love difficult people, uh, in case you've got one of those in your lives. Okay. Well, this will be a shorter sermon, since nobody has any difficult people in their lives, I guess, so... Uh, and, uh, but uh, you, can, you can access that if you go to our website under resources. Uh, you'll see it uh, listed there. Or uh, you just the same number that you just used to text uh, your presence with us. If you put the word people, uh, that will send you that text as well. But uh, last week we talked about this idea of loving critical people. And uh, I, was, uh, I, I realized that some of you recognize some critical people in your lives. Uh, and this week, I'm going to talk to you about loving, controlling people. Uh, do you have any people in your life that are controllers? Okay, so you're going to want to hear today's message, because I, 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 I have a, 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 someone like that in my life uh, as well. I, I know it probably will surprise you, but, but uh, um, well, let me tell you too how this kind of plays out. In, in my house the other day, uh, I, I don't think you guys have this problem, but I had some food that I wanted to eat. <laughs> and I didn't want this controller to know that I was eating this certain food. Uh, because I knew that this controller was going to also want to partake in my food. So I had to sneak the food and go out, go out somewhere, go somewhere else. So that this person wouldn't know that I was eating the food. Does anybody have anything like that in their lives? Right. Uh, this, this person also uh, has this knack at times of wanting a massage. You know what I'm talking about? Like a back rub, right? And, 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 and this person will go to great lengths to make sure that I pay attention to her uh, in case... Come on now, let me get through this before you get, you know, I can, I can already see the tomatoes coming, right? Uh, and, and, and we'll do, it doesn't matter if I'm, if I'm watching a movie or reading a book, she will do whatever she has to do to make sure that I'm paying attention to her, right? Uh, she also, uh, there are times, is not very pleased with me when I choose to leave the house without her permission. She would like to know where I'm going and when I'm returning and wants to know. And, and she will give me that look. Have you ever gotten that look from your significant other or other people I'm not saying? Right? And in fact, this person can be so controlling that she thinks that every time a package comes from Amazon, uh, it is for her. And, and, and she will come to the door as I'm going to get the package. As I open the door to receive the package, she immediately puts it in her mouth. Some of you were thinking I was talking about Jackie. How dare you? Did you think honestly? Yes, I am talking about our dog, Farah, who uh, I brought a box in for Brenda earlier this week to show the evidence, the, the teeth marks uh, in the package of, of an Amazon. So, you know, Jackie is, is not the controlling person, but Farah, our dog, who does honestly believe she is a person and acts that way. But let's imagine for a moment that we're not talking about a controlling pet. And we probably, many of us probably have controlling pets as well in that. But that we're actually talking about people in our lives that like to control everything about us, that at times they have so much control we feel like we're puppets on a string. You ever felt that way? Ever been in that kind of experience where someone is controlling you? And to be honest with you, if that were the case, for most of us, that would get old pretty fast, wouldn't it? Right? We, we just don't want to stay in that. We don't really want someone to tell us how to do it, when to do it, how, where to do it, all those kind of things. Now, sometimes, like if I'm in the middle of a fire, I don't mind someone telling me where to go and how to get there kind of thing. But most of the time... I don't want to be controlled like that. I want autonomy. In fact, our country is kind of founded that way, right? 
You know, we didn't want someone over across the pond telling us what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. In fact, you might say it's in our DNA to be somewhat reactive to people who try to control us. Is that true? Or is that just me? <laughs> right? If you're not sure, like I've, I use this example all the time, just imagine how you feel like when you go to Publix and you have bought, you know, your 10 items and you're in the 10 items or less lane and there's someone in front of you that's got 22 items. Do you want to control them a little bit? Right? Th those kind of things in that. So we, we understand is oftentimes, though, when we are in the presence of a controlling person, Right? And, we're, and we're, we're there, we may feel tiny. Right? We may feel smaller. Have you ever been in the presence of someone who has been controlling you, and you walk away and you say, why do I feel like an eight-year-old? Right? That's what I'm talking about in that moment. There, that something's happening there. Have you ever been in the presence of someone who has a controlling experience with you, and you kind of feel guilty because you didn't quite do what they wanted you to do, or you did what they wanted you to do, and you didn't want to do it in any ways, but you didn't want the consequences of it. That's what we're talking about. And so this morning, I want to share with you that controlling people oftentimes feel like bullies to us. Uh, and I invite you to, to look in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, beginning at verse 28. I talked about this a little bit last week, going a little bit deeper into it this week. Uh, it's the story of David and Goliath. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Beginning at verse 28, uh, when Eliab, you remember that uh, Eliab was David's oldest brother, uh, said to him, uh, came to him and said, uh, heard him speaking with the men, that he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? Now we know that David came because his father Jesse had sent him with food for the brothers and to get news about what was happening on the front lines. And so David hears this. He says, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. David said, now, now what have I done? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. And Saul replied, dude, you are just a runt of a kid. That's a, a loose translation if you're following along in there. You're like, where is that at? Right? It says, you're not able to go and fight him. You're only a little guy, a young man. And he's been a warrior from his youth. I, you know, I, in, in the Marvel movies, I think of Captain America, Steve Rogers, before he became Steve Rogers. That's what, that's what David kind of looked like. If you don't, never mind. I'll move on. Uh, but, God's, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. Not David's tunic, but Saul's tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to this. So he took them off. Then he took a staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of a shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we are your people in your presence. 
asking now for your Holy Spirit to come and be the interpreter and the translator of these words so that as we hear these words, they would take root in our hearts and our minds so that we would become that living sacrifice. We would become that people who are prepared and ready to love those difficult people in our lives and in our communities because you love us. Help us now to be fully present with you as you are with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you agree that controlling people need to be loved? Yeah. Would you agree that controlling people need to know that they matter to God? Yeah. Would you agree that controlling people need to know that they too have a seat at the table, that they're, they're not excluded because they have these things going on? Right? That's true. That's our, that's our mission. That's who we are. We're, we're a people who call people to God's table. And why do we call people to God's table? Because we know that we were invited to God's table. Right? So like our critical friends from last week, controlling people sometimes get a bad rap. Right? Uh, it is true that like our, our critical people friends, that they, they too like, you know, can suck the very life out of us. Right? If you've been around a person who's always trying to control you and you never have any freedom to do anything, I mean, it just takes all of everything out of you. But if we understand the origin of their need to be in control, if we stop for a moment and just try to understand what's their story, what's, what, what's happening behind that, we may discover what may actually happen for us is that we increase our capacity to love, our capacity, uh, our capacity to have compassion towards folks like that. You see, for many controlling people, what occurred for them in childhood was a loss of safety, right? There, somewhere, somehow, they learned a lesson that the world was not a safe place for them. And so they, they began to think, if the world's not a safe place, then who is it that I can trust? And so they began to tell them the, the story is that I need to be strong in the midst of an unsafe environment. And so they would, they would project this kind of image that strength is more important than weakness. And so they would come across in that way. And a controlling person often believed that peace comes through strength. Now, the superpower, last week we talked about the superpower of the critical person because all the, all the critical person wants to do is help you improve, right? They just want you to be better. They want to be better. Remember, we talked about a diamond in a rhinestone world right? And, and so that was their superpower, is that they could, they could see the faults in you, <laughs> right? But they would see the faults in you because they just wanted you to be a diamond. So the, the superpower of a controlling person is they can see a chaotic environment, they can see an unstable environment, they can see an environment that's out of control, and they can bring order, and, and they can bring stability, and they can bring structure into that. That's their superpower, Right? Because why? They, they saw the world, they've experienced the world as unsafe, and so they believe, that, hey, if we can do all, if we can get everything in the right order, then we can all be safe. Now, like our critical friends, our, our, our controlling friends, they sometimes have a dark underside of their belly as well, right? So, so imagine, for example, a controlling person has a superior talent. You know, they're like the star quarterback of a football team. Right, the whole team rallies around that, that quarterback. Right? Or, or maybe they're the most generous giver at the church. Or maybe they're a preacher that, that can proclaim the message so well that people come from all different directions and they, and they fill the pews and that. Okay? And so, they, have, so they, they understand this. And internally, that, that person, that controller that has that, that superpower, that super skill, that super talent, knows that they have that. And it gives them that confidence to operate. And they, and they kind of hold themselves that way. But imagine one day things don't go the way that they want. Right? And because things don't go the way they want and they can no longer express the, the control that they have, the next thing that comes out of their mouth is, I want to be traded. Right? I want to go to a new team. Or I'm going to go to a new church. Or I'm not going to preach any longer, right? And so what do they do? They, they pack up those proverbial toys, they put them in their bag, and they what? They leave. 
Why? Because they're, they're expressing their control over the situation. Now, we're on the other end of that, right? And because we're on the other end, most of the time what happens is that we've experienced someone who's got this great talent, they've got this great skill, and we think to ourselves, oh, what will happen if they leave, right? And so we become afraid, and we, and we, won't, we won't address, and so we, we hold folks off at a difference. And so what happens a lot of times is many organizations... Many families, many institutions, they will, they will surrender their voice, their thoughts, and they will, just, they will just embrace the unwelcomed behavior of the controlling person. Why? Because they're afraid of the consequences. I watched this over and over growing up in a very dysfunctional family. Right? My mom was always afraid of what would happen if the primary breadwinner was no longer in the house. You understand what I'm saying? This, this, is how, this is that dark underside of the belly for a control, controlling situation. An unchecked controlling person may not get their way. And so they choose. And so what we tend to do, what we could do, is we become silent. And that's one of the challenges that we face is how do I love somebody that way? How, how do I come across, how do I get to a point of saying, here's a line in the sand. <laughs> you, you, you've, crossed that, you've crossed that line. How do we get to a point of saying, sorry, I, I love you so much that I can't let you keep controlling me this way. I can't let you keep making me feel so tiny. I can't let you keep making me feel so guilty. And I'm telling you these things because I love you. And yet what happens is there's this fear that the moment I do that, they're going to go off in a different direction. And I'm stuck with the consequences. David gives us some insight as to how to do this. But before I do that, I just want, I'm going to share a couple of principles this week. And just like I shared a couple of principles last week, the, the principles I shared last week are not just for how do I talk to a, contr- uh, 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 um, a critical person. Th- those principles also apply to talking to you know, a controlling person, just like the principles I'm about to talk to you will apply to a critical person. The idea is that, is, is that I would keep building on these principles, and throughout the year, The reason is because I just think that this is a year when now more than ever, we have to learn how to love difficult people. That Christians have have an opportunity, have a privilege to be able to show love in a very difficult world. The challenge that we have is if you go out and talk to to the, the average person about Christians, they're oftentimes, we're oftentimes seen as what? The critical and the controlling people. Right? So we have to learn how to love difficult people and the world needs us to do that, which is why I want to talk to you about the first, the first principle to loving a controlling person is to develop an inner confidence. It's almost impossible to love a controlling person without having some inner confidence, an inner sense of who you are, because a controlling person, when you confront that controlling person, when you have that conversation with that controlling person, they're already believing they're bigger than life. Why? Because life is scary to them. You know the saying, if, you, if you're ever chased by a bear, right, make sure that you're running with someone who's slower than you. But if that doesn't work out, then what you try to do is what? Look bigger than the bear, right? And so a controlling person wants to, it looks bigger than life, right? And, and so if you don't have a sense of who you are, you're not going to be able to stand up in, that, in those moments, Without inner confidence, you're going to ultimately get stuck trying to be a people pleaser, trying to, trying to win the approval of that person. You'll be paralyzed by the consequences of disappointing people. Now, I'm going to remind you, is there anybody here who does not like to be in control? Let me dictate what you will have for lunch today. What television programs? Anybody get upset in your household if someone else is holding your remote control? Okay, just, just, we all like to be in control. I'm not talking necessarily about that, right? But I'm talking about when the sense of when you are in the presence of a controller and you, and they are able to get you to do something that you don't necessarily want to do. And I'm not talking about something evil or something illegal, Right? But you just, you, just, you just know, you just have this sense that it's just not worth the argument. I'm just going to go do what they tell me to do. But you feel guilty about it. 
Because it's like, you know, once again, I'm doing something I don't want to do. Okay? That's, that's one evidence. The other side of that is you finally say no to a person. And you, you, you're like, no, I, I'm not doing that anymore. And then the consequences happen. They, they, they actually, the person actually says, fine, I'm leaving. I'm done. And now you are stuck with the consequences of it. And you feel guilty and shame about that as well. That's how you know you're in the presence of, of a controller. Right? So guilt and shame are, are some of the emotions that are attached to that. Now, people-pleasing is a form of idolatry. And to understand that, we have to understand what people-pleasing looks like, how it sounds. One, people-pleasing is constantly seeking approval uh, to, to, in order to feel validated and worthy of acceptance. Let me just ask you this question. How would you feel if after every Sunday I preached a sermon and I came to each one of you and said, was that a good sermon? Was that a good sermon? Was that a good sermon? Would you tell me, is that a good sermon? And I did that week after week after week. Wouldn't you think, oh my gosh, that dude has serious problems. Now, you might already think that, right? Right, but, but we, 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 we understand people walking around, you know, all the time and saying, hey, did I do that right? Did I do that good? Uh, did, are you proud of what I did? Did, did, did that meet your, your, you know what I'm saying? That's part of that people-pleasing mode. Now, now, a lot of folks, they may not be that, that uh, obnoxious and saying those things out loud, but they may internally do a lot of good things, do a lot of nice things, and they're waiting to hear, hey, you did good. I'm really proud of what you did, and they don't hear it. And the silence almost eats them alive. Okay, that's, that's one Two is the difficulty of saying no, fearing you will disappoint or upset someone, so you sacrifice your own needs and desires rather than to say no. Number three, you avoid saying the things that need to be said because you fear conflict and rejection. In other words, you'll go to these great lengths to, to push down, to suppress whatever thoughts you have, whatever feelings you have, whatever emotions you have. Why? Just in order to maintain the relationship. So the biggest reason that people-pleasing is a form of idolatry is because you take the opinion of other people and you elevate it above God's opinion of you. God said, listen, just so I can have the right, just so I can have the privilege to give you my opinion of you, I'm going to be humiliated. I'm going to be insulted. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be crucified just so I could tell you how much I love you. Just, just so I could tell you how much you matter to me. God says, I want, I'm going to do all of that just so I can tell you that you are my masterpiece, that you're the apple of my eye. And when we get in a people-pleasing mode, we place their opinions above that opinion. Right? Right? Imagine saying to somebody, listen, before you give me your opinion, I want you to go outside, let me hit you with my car, and then I want to back up and hit you again, and then let me do it one more time, just for good measure, and then I'll listen to your opinion, right? And do you think they would stand up and say, oh, you're the apple of my eye. You're my most beloved. But that's what God does. God says, I love you so much that I gave my life for you. But we get stuck in this... In this uh, putting other people's opinion above what God's opinion is of us. And what we do is we keep chasing after other people's opinions and we find ourselves on this treadmill that cannot be sustained. This means that if, if that's the case for us, then we won't have the inner confidence to love a controlling person because we're constantly going to be trying to win their approval. Paul says this in Galatians, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul's pastoring a church. You know, he's trying to lead his church. You know, of course he wants people to, to, to come alongside him, but he also says, listen, I, I first have to follow Christ. In fact, he tells us, listen, here is the source of your inner confidence. He says this in Colossians, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
To love controlling people, we must develop an inner confidence. And we see that in David when he has this confrontation with Eliab. Eliab comes and calls him all kinds of names, tells him all kinds of things. And what does David do? He doesn't burn the bridge. He doesn't retaliate with words. It tells us in the scripture that what he did is he turned to a third party. Remember that? He turned to someone else to hear hear this news. Now, that wasn't about people pleasing. In that moment, David was connecting with what was inside him. Remember, David had heard uh, Samuel anoint him and says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. So he was hearing these things from his brother, right? But it wasn't aligning with what he was hearing in his heart. You come here on Sunday morning and you hear, you are God's beloved, You're God's beloved son, God's beloved daughter, you're God's masterpiece, and you go out in the world, you go to work, or you go home, or you go somewhere else, and they say, oh no, you're not even worthy to gather up the crumbs underneath the table. And some of us get stuck saying, that opinion is better than God's opinion. See, we got to have that inner confidence, is what what I'm trying to get after here. So he seeks assistance from other people. David knows the words he's hearing from Eliab don't align. What I, I do this myself. I have a spiritual director I meet with. I have a coach that I meet with. There, there are other, other Christian pastors that I meet with here in our church. I mean, I've got Papa Tim, you know, that I meet with, you know. And, 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 and so we have, we, we have, when there's things that are out of alignment, we're looking for people who are also connected to the vine, who are hearing from God as well. That's what David does. He turns, he says, that, you're my brother, I love you, but something doesn't sound right. I, I need to hear something. We have spiritual life groups for that purpose, for you to gather with other Christians, because you're going to hear things, you're going to work on things and do things and say, and, and you're going to feel like you're, you're so low. Well, you say this as a kid, you're, I can cut you so low, you couldn't even play handball on the side of a dime, right? I mean, and so we hear these kind of stories, I asked folks on Tuesday when we were getting together for lunch, I said, so what do you guys, and I'm not trying to go anywhere here, I'm just asking a question, right? So what do you guys make of this argument about how old you can be to be the president of the United States or not? I'm not just, right? Because I'm thinking about what is it, what, might, what messages might you be saying to yourself these days? Does it align with what God says about you? So we have to be willing to return to a third party. Jesus said, unless you remain in me, you cannot bear fruit, right? What he means is unless you remain connected with what I say about you, unless you remain connected to who, who I say you are, if all you do is walk around and you want to keep saying, oh, I'm condemned, I'm judged, I'm less than, then you're not hearing Jesus' message. I loved you so much that I was willing to give my life for you. No greater love does one have than to lay down one's... This is what Jesus said about you. That's what he said about me. So when we have that inner confidence, then we can do the next thing, which is establish healthy boundaries. The only way to establish those healthy boundaries is to keep your eye on the mission. David had his eyes firmly set on the mission. The mission was bring food to my brothers and bring news back to my dad about what's happening on the front line. As he's moving along, he hears Goliath taunting God and taunting the people of Israel. His mission changed In that moment, he said, I want to defend my God. I want to defend my people. He became like Jesus. Jesus set his face firmly on Jerusalem, and he would not be deterred one way or the other. Even when Peter stood up and said, oh, no, you'll not suffer. You'll not die. Peter says, oh, no. Or Jesus said, no, I am. My face is firmly set. When he got in the garden, it was firmly set on the cross. So that you and I would hear the message. When Saul attempted to outfit David in armor that did not fit, David stayed true to his calling. Now, Saul says, here, put on this armor. And David listened, right? We can take, can, we can take uh, opinions and, and advice from, from controlling people. And we say, oh, well, let me try that on. But David had this inner confidence. And when he tried this on, he said, I'm not used to that. That doesn't fit me right. And because he had this inner confidence, he was able to what? Maintain his healthy boundaries and say, I'm not wearing that armor. That's not who I am. Now, I want you just for a moment, imagine the pressure that King Saul was feeling, right? Saul understood. Goliath had come out and said, listen, you bring your best champion to come against me. 
if your best champion beats me, then all of Philistine will belong to Israel. But if I beat your best champion, all of you will be my slaves. There's a lot at stake. You can imagine that, that Saul was going to be pretty adamant about trying to control the situation. I mean, here's this little 15-year-old kid coming in saying, let me fight, let me fight. Put me in, coach. You're like, you've never thrown a football, right? You, you have no idea what the game is. Oh, I've killed the lion and the bear. Yeah, but you haven't touched Goliath. Put on this armor. And yet in the midst of all that, David tried on the armor, and he still said the resolve to say, no, that is not who I am. When I think about that, I think about women who feel stuck in a home with an abusive husband. I, I think about children who are stuck with abusive parents or employees with abusive bosses. How much inner confidence is required to say, the life you're trying to make me walk, the life you're trying to make me wear, it doesn't fit me. It takes that inner confidence to do that. Jesus is our model. As I said earlier, it is virtually impossible to love a controlling person without inner confidence because you won't be able to sustain healthy relationships. You will eventually move to a place of trying to people please. Jesus is our model of how to love controlling people. He consistently showed compassion and understanding towards those who sought to control and manipulate others. He understood, he understood the source of their brokenness and their insecurity. And he understood the, what the behaviors behind that and it allowed him to have empathy and to hear and to listen for the story. And so he spoke with love and not condemnation. And when he spoke, he spoke words of love and truth. He would call them. He would say, hey, what you're doing, stop doing that. Don't, don't sin anymore. Right? But he would say it in love. Jesus championed the cause of the vulnerable and the marginalized by standing up to controlling systems and individuals. How did he do that? Because he knew he was the alpha and the omega. He knew he was the beginning and the end. He knew he was the sustainer and the redeemer. He knew that he was sent to set you and me free, to set all of us. So he had this inner confidence of who he was. Jesus' mission has been and continues to be asserting that all people... Even the most difficult, controlling, critical, hostile people are people of worth and dignity. The question for us this morning is, are we willing to join his cause? Are, are we willing to be more consistent and intentional in loving, difficult people? Hey, my friends, here's good news. There's lots of difficult people out there. They're all over the place. So if you say yes, you will be gainfully employed, right? So what will we do? What will be your next step? Perhaps your next step is to, to be still with the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I need your help in, in either building or rebuilding that inner confidence. I, I need help in, in remembering and hearing who it is that I am in your eyes. Perhaps you've got that, that controlling person in your life and you've got to say to God, God, help me to figure out what I can do to help that person feel more safe uh, in this world. Perhaps you need to, to look for a third party. You, you need to speak to someone else and say, hey, I need some help in establishing some healthy boundaries. I invite you to, to reach out to me if that's something in your mind. Maybe it's something as simple as downloading that Bible reading plan. Critical and controlling people need to know that they're loved by Jesus. May it be our mission to be used by Jesus so that they all know that they matter to God. Will you pray with me? Father, again, I ask that these words take root in our hearts and in our minds, that you would just continue to water these seeds because we are living in a world and in a time when it is far easier to be angry and to be mean than it is to show love. But you call us, you gave to us the example of what it means to love. It's in your name we pray. Amen.